happy holidays. It's so good to be back with you this Sunday. I missed you. And um, you might have recognized in our Advent candle lighting today that Annika and her family lit that Advent candle. Annika is a yoga teacher, and she told me that she and her family celebrated this year Diwali, which is a Hindu uh, celebration, usually happens in October, November, and it's five days of a festival of light. There's so many holidays that go on during this time, and I want to honor as many of them as we can. It's, it's hard to you know, start listing, and we might miss something. Um, but I do want to wish a happy Hanukkah to all of those in our, of our Unitic family that also celebrate the Jewish holiday. It starts this Thursday. And uh, to, uh, it's not today, actually, it's on Tuesday. Today's St. Nicholas Day, which is a European Christian tradition uh, honoring the, the inspiration for, for Santa Claus, of course. Um, and then on Tuesday is um, Bodhi Day, which is Bodhi Day, actually, is how you say it, um, which is actually a, a Buddhist holiday that feels like it's right on target for today's Advent peace. Um, it is the day that commemorates when the Buddha became enlightened under the Bodhi tree. So um, that will be on Tuesday this week as well. In our Christian and our New Thought tradition, we celebrate Advent. This is this time throughout the preparation time, the four weeks that come up into that Christmas day, of course, the rebirth of the Christ within us all, that celebration of the divine in us. And this time of preparation then is marked by divine qualities along the way. So the first Sunday is faith, this Sunday is peace, and then love and joy to come. I hope you enjoyed last week's message with my friend uh, Kathy Norman. She spoke from her kitchen on faith, and it's been really a joy to watch her journey, this divine order unfolding, this faith-filled journey that has brought her from uh, a whole long, very long career since she was 21 um, as a unity minister and then moving into this keto baking ministry that she's doing now. So, um, so I thought it was fun to hear from her from her kitchen, and I hope you did too. So now... We enter the advent of peace. Peace. It's good time for peace, isn't it? You may not be feeling especially peaceful these days. There's a lot going on, of course, in our world, and it just seems to keep ramping up and ramping up. And by forced outer circumstance now, and really by spiritual crisis that's been going on for a really long time, and it's just now manifesting in this way, we are decreed to go within, to stay home, to be still, essentially. Our holidays are not as outwardly shiny and fast-moving this year. I believe we're in another phase of a significant collective spiritual awakening, and that's the good news. So usually our culture about now is knee-deep in it, right? We're out shopping and cooking and entertaining and preparing and getting ready for social gatherings and, and all of that hustle and bustle that happens this time of year. And instead, we're decreed to be still, to be quiet, to go within, to retreat. And it seems unfathomable, really, I mean, if you think about, and certainly unforeseeable, if you think about a year ago from now, could you have ever imagined that health officials and government leaders during the most busy retail season in America in our consumeristic society would tell us stop and go home? I mean, it's pretty amazing what's going on around us, what's going on inside of us. At first blush, it might not bring you a lot of peace to think, well, now we've got these stay-at-home orders. They go into effect tonight, I think around 10 p.m. And there might be disappointment around holiday gatherings that you had planned to do with family or friends or maybe even a, a deepened worry or sense about health and well-being of yourself and your loved ones. And so, so if this worry, this health and this well-being, this, this maybe is being seen by you as bad news, what do we do about it, right? Should we just worry more, wring our hands? <laughs> Should we talk about how awful it is and invite our friends to add to how awful it is? Should we just shake our heads and mutter at how terrible it all is? Should we throw up our arms and give up? Should we lose sleep over this? Well, we could probably answer all of those questions. What is best for us, right? What is best for each other? What is best for our families and, and ourselves? There's an old familiar story that might help bring a little perspective. 
It's a, for, it's a story about a Chinese farmer and his son. The Chinese farmer and his son had a beloved horse, and that horse actually supported their livelihood. One day, the horse ran away, and the neighbors came over to the farmer, and they said, oh, what terrible news! Your horse has run away! What bad luck! And the farmer said, maybe so, maybe not. Wasn't but a few days later, the horse came back with more wild horses behind him. And now in their farm, they had several horses. The neighbors were just a titter. Oh my goodness, how wonderful, what fabulous, fortunate news for you. You've got four horses now. And the Chinese farmer simply said, maybe so, maybe not. It was just a week or so later that his young son was breaking the horses and one of the mares threw him and he broke his leg. Now you know what the neighbor said. Oh, what terrible luck. How awful it is that your son broke his leg. But the farmer remained in the same place of peace, really. Maybe so, maybe not, he said. A couple weeks later, the National Army came through town and they were recruiting all the young men to join the army. But of course, they had to pass over the farmer's son because he broke his leg. Oh, how wonderful, what great news. Your son was spared, the neighbors ran to say to the farmer. And the farmer said, you can fill it in. Maybe so, maybe not, we'll see. Is it really possible to tell if news is good or bad? Because so often we don't see the whole picture, do we? And since we are ultimately one, can we really suss out what is bad for one or good for another? Do we really know? Is this really the question we should be asking if something is bad or good and how we should react to it? So often, our egoic minds want to do that. We want to categorize. Is this bad, and should I worry and get upset about it and, you know, kind of get everything in a, in a sense of, uh, you know, worry and chaos? Or should I not worry about it, and it's good news? Should I celebrate it? Is it joyous? And so there's something being taught here by the farmer. Right now, we're, we're, you know, we always know that we are one, that we are one body. As, as, but one body of humanity is really clear to us now when we're going through something like a pandemic. That there is illness, yes, and there is health and thriving and wholeness. There is death, yes, and there is life. We are one body experiencing one movement of life itself, of illness and health of death and life. It doesn't get any more real than that. And so that's why this is such a poignant time, such a sacred time, really. So we have more information now, you know, in this process of the pandemic, which might put at some of us our minds at ease a little bit. I know it does help me when I have a little more information, and I'm guessing it, it does you too. And, but it also may feel a little more daunting now as things are ratcheting up and you're hearing more and more about the statistics. And so the question then to ask is not so much, is it good, is it bad? It's not so much about that, but just how will we be with it? How will we enter into what is present for us now? How can we just be present with what is? Just here and now, period, without making a story about it. So ultimately, the question of what is good or bad doesn't serve us. And so what we can know is that we do need the power of discernment, of course, but we don't necessarily need so much of the judgment that comes with it. That's the part that weighs us down. That's the part that gets us sort of in trouble, if you will, or at least brings on the heavier energies. And so if instead of, of asking these questions and, and making judgments, we can just stop disrupting the flow of spirit, because that's what those judgments do, and just open up and allow a little bit more of what is. Let it unfold in its time. Maybe it's good, maybe it's not. We'll see. To be in that kind of space. Then we are always faced with a choice, right? Will I disrupt the flow or will I just allow? Will I be open? Will I simply be and then act and respond as I am guided to act or respond and not make a whole lot of mess otherwise? 
dropping the drama that grips our hearts and minds right now, or could grip our hearts and minds right now, opens us up to more ease and to do our part to contribute to that ease and that peace in our world. And I know that all of us unitics love to contribute to peace. We sing it every Sunday. Let peace begin with me. Let there be peace on earth. It's a great and deep wish throughout our movement. And so as we really fully enter into the advent of peace, we can be this for one another. We can be this for ourselves. We can really become peace. So knowing that we live in an ever-changing universe that is constantly evolving, if we can trust that, if we can affirm that and know that, we know too that we are a part of that universe. We are constantly evolving. We are constantly moving and changing. So to just know that that's part of the natural flow, that things are moving and changing. This iconic story of the Chinese farmer reminds me to stay present to stay in the here and now, to be grounded just here and now, to remember that there is an unfolding, a greater divine picture that I cannot yet see. I don't know if the story does anything for you. Maybe so, maybe not. You'll see. The outer story of Christmas, of course, is about the birth of Jesus. But really, Advent, these four weeks, they belong to Mother Mary. This is Mother Mary's story. She shows us how to embody, how to um, be in each one of these qualities by how she moves through this time with such grace and peace and in the divine flow. Mary is pregnant with divine possibility. She's a stand-in for us, like we are pregnant for the Christ spirit within us that is coming forth at Christmas, that we are carrying this too, as she carries this child in the same way. And she shows us how to make the most of each, each of these qualities as she receives the seemingly impossible news or worrisome news. And how does she receive it? She receives it by saying, here I am, a servant of God. Let it be according to your word. Mary receives with an openness, with a receptivity, with a sense of allowing. She never leaves that commitment to peace, to the divine flow. And Mary, like all of us, she had a choice, right? She could have kicked and screamed. She could have resisted. She could have made it a just terrible news. She could have made it really difficult for herself, for her baby to be, for Joseph, for everyone around her. But that's not the path she chose. And we always have a choice too. So what choice do we make? Will we, you know, the old adage, what we resist persists. There's a lot of truth to that. I want to invite you into a visualization for a moment, just to close your eyes and take a nice deep breath and you find yourself centered in your heart for a moment. And just see, just ask spirit, is there anything I'm resisting now? might be about some of the news we're talking about, resisting the change in the holidays, plans that you might have had, or resistance to the very existence of the coronavirus, or it might be something else, resistant to your spiritual practices, resistant to, to going within, resistance to having a conversation you need to have, or something that wants to be born through you. Whatever it is, just take a moment to listen, to be still, to see what spirit has for you. It might be revealed in a feeling of tension in your body, in words. Is there anything I am resisting? If there is a feeling of tension or resistance or even a knowing of what it's about, let's just take some breaths to bring spaciousness to this place within us.
very life breath of spirit begins to break up some of those tense energies and sensations. <clears throat> And it allows us to open up, to get into the space of allowing, of receiving the divine flow of life, the very essence of peace. So I encourage you to maybe do a little bit more work around this kind of visualization whenever you feel the call to calm down a bit. This energy that I've been talking about with Mary, it's the energy of yin. This is the season of yin, actually. Winter is a natural rhythm, at least in the northern hemisphere, of yin. And that is as in yin-yang, you know the symbol, the Taoist symbol, where the yin and the yang, are they are one, they are whole, they are nestled within one another. They're both important and they're both part of our wholeness. Yang is more of a summertime energy. It's a, it's a doing energy. It's a masculine outer energy. Where yin is that, that, that pull within energy. It's a feminine energy. It's a time, it's a cycle of nighttime. It's ruled by the moon rather than the sun. That's what we're in now. That's why this is a perfect time for peace. This is a perfect time for this decree to go within, to really be with it. So our culture can leave us really starved for yin because we are such a yang, out-of-balance culture. And so this time can really be just such a gift of saying yes to yin. It's a time to enhance our spiritual practices because the energy will be with you. So if, it, if you've been thinking about maybe getting back into a practice of meditation or prayer or just having more quiet time, you will be, you're, it will be easier for you because you will be in the flow that is all around on earth and through earth and through us. It's how, it's how our bodies line up with, with the natural rhythm of the season. We just often sort of ignore it because we're so distracted. So we don't even know really in some ways that we're starved of yin because we're so distracted. But now the distractions, maybe some of them will be falling away for us. And those who are working on the front lines may not feel as much of this call within, but there will still be times when you can practice in this way. So on winter solstice, of course, we'll celebrate the coming of the light. And on Christmas Day, of course, we'll celebrate the, the birth of, of the divine, the Christ within us. That light is coming, but you know, so often in our Yang culture, we want to just zoom ahead. Let's zoom ahead to the celebration. Let's, you know, it's so extroverted. Our culture is about, you know, let's let's get to the place where we all gather and have joy together. And we don't really always want to allow the quiet night that is here for us. But we can't live just in half of a hemisphere. We need the whole deal. We need the wholeness of who we are. And that is what I think we are deeply called into at this time. It is no mistake that we have these orders to go within that start tonight on the Sunday Advent of Peace. So we'll miss the spiritual point if, if we don't, in the season of light, also celebrate the darkness. The season of yin on earth is a time of rest. We see that in a natural way, right? That autumn, you know, gives over to the dormancy of winter and that everything is still and quiet until spring will blossom again. And it will come again, yes, but right now it's winter time. If you can think of it as the naked beauty of a tree, you know, with, with it's no leaves on anymore and so as you as you see the stark beauty of that, you can see through to the depth of the whole forest. It's the same with ourselves. If we embrace sort of the nakedness of this season, the, if you will, the emptiness, the quiet, the darkness of the season, we'll be able to see through to something deeper and more whole and true in ourselves. That's the invitation. It's no wonder the Buddha became enlightened in early December. It's the time. When we embrace rather than resist what is, we find that rare beauty. And I really want to invite us into that. We couldn't have a more perfect song today. The 360s sing, 
Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah, but it's John Shin's new words to it about the oneness with God. And it still has all the haunting beauty of the song Hallelujah that we all love. Let's listen. Welcome to the 360s bubble. We are hoping you all have a wonderful holiday. They say there is a sacred chord when played returns alive once more.
Well, that was just absolutely gorgeous in every way to experience how uh, these four men are really just enjoying, obviously, their music together, and also Jack Nichols' visuals. Uh, we give thanks for that. And Peter Weiler, by the way, did the visuals for the meditation, which were equally beautiful. So thanks to our team once again for all that they do to bring this service together. So as we consider being a part of uh, allowing ourselves to drop into and consciously be a part of nature's cycles at this time, we, and we also uh, tune into that divine decree within or underneath the orders that we are given to, to go within to the true home, right? The home within us, the sanctuary within us. We might actually finally learn how to yin. I'm using it as a verb. <laughs> and, and what would that look like? You know, the yin is like these little presents we can unwrap of simple pleasures. It's lighting a candle and sitting in the quiet with your eyes closed in the glow of that candle. Maybe listening to a piece of music that you love that soothes your soul and just only that, not doing anything else, but just allowing that music to just really seep in or Maybe read a poem that you, you love or a new one, or maybe just one line of a poem and just let that, you know, just let it rest in the cells of your body. Take a hot bath, go for a walk in nature, cuddle with your partner or your pet or your stuffed animal or your warm blanket, you know, just sort of getting in that cozy kind of space. Turn on the Christmas lights or the holiday lights and, you know, sip some tea and there's so many wonderful things we can do this time of year that really coincides with this season of yin that brings forth more of this experience of peace and allows us to be in that flow. You can check in with your heart throughout the day. How am I feeling? What am I needing? And ask the people that you love the same question. You can make a soul collage. There's no end to what can happen when we fully immerse ourselves in this energy that we are really truly hungry for in our society and maybe individually too. All this yin-like being nurtures, of course, more peace. And then it radiates from us. So we not only experience it, but we bring it into the world by allowing ourselves to practice in this way. We may discover something pretty interesting and surprising during this particular time that the deepest peace is found in the empty silent spaces within us. The angels in the Christmas story say these three words over and over again, be not afraid. And when we are in the flow of peace, when we are steeped in the season of yin, we are not afraid. We know this because we allow, because we give over, because we are in the divine flow, knowing that there is an unfolding greater plan than we maybe can see at the moment. And so when we know that, we are much like the Chinese farmer, right? He is a, a, a Dharma teacher by being a no drama teacher. His way of non-reactivity is, is really sage-like for 2020 in particular to sort of embody the kind of teaching that he gives to us. And we need more no drama teachers right now. I wonder if you will consider being one of these. I hope we all will be because it, we will provide so much to our world by doing that. So as spiritual citizens, we can refuse to add to the chaos and the frenzy. Instead, we can choose to exude more peace. There's no denying that right now is there's a time of gravity here, right? And with gravity, there's a sense of sacredness. So it's not to overlook the fact that people are dying in large numbers and there is illness all around us. There is a sense of gravity here. It's just that we don't need to get swallowed up in it. We can just breathe, peace, be still. The light is coming. And by entering fully into the dark, the fullness of the grace of the light can come forth. This is the gift we offer at this time. When the priest Zachariah's son, John the Baptist, was born, he gave a prophecy of his child. And it is as relevant for 2020 in the midst of this pandemic as ever. It goes like this. 
by the tender mercy of our God, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide our feet in the way of peace. As we fully welcome this season of yin, let's drop our resistance. Let's be in the flow. Let's allow ourselves to really become the peace. And as we do so, we just follow the divine decree to the extent that we are able, stay home, go within, nurture this, especially now during these next couple of weeks before winter solstice. Let's be still, let's become peace. Let's usher it in. Let's be the ones who it begins with. I wanna invite you to affirm this with me as we move into fully and deeply the energy of peace together. By divine decree, I go within. Peace be still and know that I am. Peace be upon us. Amen. Thank you.